the Heroes of Might and Magic series is 21 years old, or it will be this August. And while I'd love to stay and chat with you about the entire series about its ups and downs and its total betrayals of what the core of the games were, looking at you Ubisoft, looking at you as always, I find myself lacking the time to do that properly. So instead I would like to tell you about the game which I love most dearly of them all, Heroes of Might and Magic 2. Now I'm under no impression that this is the best game of the series, a lot of people will tell you that that would be the third one, and I'm inclined to agree with them, because on a gameplay basis it was the best of them all, or at least the best of them all in this type of gameplay that the series had, because at one point it changed, then it went back, then it went sideways and things happen, let's not talk about those. But I really couldn't get that much into Heroes 3 because of the way it felt, the way it looked. It, it wasn't a fairy tale, it didn't have that whimsy, that magic that Heroes of Might and Magic 2 had. And it's all mostly because of the style, the presentation, the graphics, the music, the way the characters moved. Heroes of Might and Magic 2 looked mostly like no game of the franchise before it. While you could argue that maybe it had the same colorful style of visuals that the Might and Magic games had from 3 to 5, those games tended to a certain aesthetic which was somewhat mirrored in Heroes of Might and Magic 1. Heroes 2 did its own thing, and it did it right. It did it in a way that let things be beautiful, let things be whimsical, be fantastic. You saw an elf in that game, it looked like a cute elf. And I mean cute as in with a point he had, not cute as in oh my god I want to bang that elf, like in Warcraft. Pixies were cute little things, deadly but cute. Well, deadly in large numbers because they were useless by themselves. And yet it had more menacing things like the dragons, the hydras and so forth. They may have all been cartoonish, but they were the right kind of cartoonish, not the everything's fluffy and adorable kind and not the everything's super dark kind. And the series kind of abandoned that idea with the third game because they went with representations of how things looked in the Might and Magic series then, Might and Magic 6 and 7. They had more or less the same sprites. And it's not something that damages the game, it just makes Heroes of Might and Magic 2 more unique, more vibrant, more magical. I still remember when I first played it, looking at that black map with all those colored dots that made it look so, well, inviting, mysterious, alluring. Like a fairy tale, it was magic. And at that time it was unique. Well at least for me it was. It had a perfect tone, a perfect atmosphere, a perfect soundtrack by the way, the music in this game is amazing, that set it apart. That made it the gold standard for the entire series, well at least for me when it comes to presentation. Also in terms of not having crowded gameplay, in the sense that I was honestly expecting that the next expansion to Heroes 3 would bring about snot dragons or mucus golems, those would be the only things they hadn't added yet. In terms of gameplay, Heroes of Might and Magic 2 had its limits, and a lot of them stem from the fact that this was a quickly made sequel. Yes, my favorite game of them all is a quickly made sequel. The kind I often complain that companies just churn out without any thought to actually improving things. Well, this one actually improved things, and it was made within a year, mostly based on the exact same code that Heroes of Might and Magic 1 had, but with better graphics and expanded that content. For comparison, it took neural computing three entire years to make Heroes of Might and Magic 3, and in that game they more or less did everything from scratch, and it showed because it's a great game, not good looking, but great. If you haven't played the series, well, I'm sorry for you, and also sorry because I started this show without really getting to explaining what this game's about. 
The core of it is based around random maps on which you start out with a hero in a castle. Both of them belonging to your chosen faction, be it a wizard, a knight, a sorceress, a warlock, a necromancer, and well that's... Oh no, there was also the barbarian. In that castle you erect several buildings from which you'll recruit several creatures. On the map you'll find mines that you have to control in order to get resources every week or just random stuff flittered around that you can collect to get instant resources, which you then use to buy creatures and buildings. You'll then use those creatures controlled by that hero to fight your way around the map either against neutral creatures or against other heroes with other castles with the objective of becoming the one and only ruler of the castles. You'd gather experience, you'd find new spells, you'd get better skills, you would acquire powerful artifacts and so forth. All very useful in your journey to become the one true ruler of the kingdom. That or finding some artifact, defeating a certain opponent, reaching a certain sum when it comes to gold, it depends a lot on the map of objectives. That's what happens in skirmish and multiplayer modes. The games did however have campaign modes which got progressively better at storytelling. No matter how reviled it may be by some people, Heroes of Might and Magic 4 had fantastic storytelling. Heroes of Might and Magic 2 and 3 both had branching storylines in their campaign. Well, 2 had, I'm not entirely sure about number 3. The series had a very simple formula and Heroes of Might and Magic 2 embraced that simplicity. Well, not really embraced it because Heroes 1 was simple but it refined it, it made it a minimal viable product that was actually kind of amazing. It's a formula that works perfectly, it's a formula that other series have used, it's a formula that is very enjoyable to play and yet somehow really easy to screw up by some people. Yep, still looking at you Ubisoft. It's a strategy game that I found to be a lot less aggravating than most of its brethren because, for the most part, it will not put you into stressful situations all that often. It gave you time. Well, every turn-based game gave you time, but this one gave you time with style. It had a charm to it. Because of a combination of graphics and music that how shall i put this if you haven't listened to the music in the heroes of might and magic game then you do not understand video game music i've listened to those midi tunes from back in the day more times than i can count not even when playing the game i just recorded them from the game and just listened to them over and over again because the songs were amazing and they also had cd versions and versions with opera in them because it was that kind of game and I'm probably not doing it justice with the way I'm describing it. For me this game is more than its gameplay, it's a mood, it's a thing that's part of me. I've done this show, like almost this exact show, about every year for the past, I don't know, I think maybe 6 years. I do it now because this is when I started playing it for the first time a, a long time ago. And it's when I reserve myself a few hours to play it again, even if it's the same map, Broken Alliance for the billionth time, because this game is just that enjoyable. The replay value in it is... I don't know if I've replayed the same map as many times in any other game apart from this one. Well yeah, there would be Counter-Strike and Team Fortress, but strategy-wise, I don't think there are. This game attracted me with its core gameplay, with its graphics, with its music, with its ideas. It didn't need to keep me glued there with progression systems that gave me powerful artifacts after about a, a bajillion in the Jillian games, no. It didn't need to integrate Skype into the main menu. It didn't need so many bells and whistles which the series constantly received, especially in the past few iterations of it. It just needed to be good. And even though Heroes of Might and Magic 2 isn't as vast, as complex, as large, as ambitious as Heroes of Might and Magic 3, it is a good game. It is a very good game, which I really recommend that you try. Especially now since GOG actually fixed the damn thing so the audio won't crack and crash the desktop. Well, the Windows version seems to not be working at all now, but hey, the DOS one is... Uh, quite playable, like they've done a lot of progress with making it 
look amazing on current systems. The Windows 1 actually had problems with scaling on modern systems, which I didn't really encounter in the old one. But now the GOG version finally makes my CD version pointless because it's the better one. So if you're in the mood for a good strategy game with the kind of styling you don't see so often, the kind of styling that isn't dark, isn't cynical, isn't World of Warcraft repeated garbage. Not that Warcraft's style is garbage, but the repetition of it is utter garbage. If you want a fantasy game that looks like an actual fantasy game should look, you know, fantastical. If you want a game that actually felt original, then give Heroes of Might and Magic 2 a try. It can be yours on GOG for about 9 euros, well less than 9 euros, but around there. You'll probably find it on sale soon. Now if you'll excuse me, I've gotta get back to playing some Heroes of Might and Magic 2, and good old Enrot, and maybe some Clouds of Xene, Dark Side of Xene, and so many many other beautiful maps. If you enjoyed this show, hit the like button, subscribe and share it with your friends. Or, if you thought it was horrible, then share it with your enemies and make them suffer. We shall be your weapon of vengeance. But if you liked what you saw, you could, I don't know, maybe donate because basically YouTube is horrible at revenue by using the link in the description or just buy my book. It's a fantasy book about, well, a lot of stuff. I guarantee it won't suck, and if it does suck, you can find me here and complain about it.